Good evening, everyone, and welcome to IOP, this IOP speakers event, Does the Truth Still Matter, in conversation with Chris Christie. My name is Hank Hyatt. I'm a third year in the college studying political science and economics. I am secretary of the board here at UChicago College Republicans. It is my honor to introduce today's speaker, of course, none other than the former governor, Chris Christie. As the 55th governor of New Jersey, he saw the state through bold fiscal reforms and tough decision making to aid in its recovery from the 2008 financial crisis. His leadership during Hurricane Sandy in 2012 showcased his ability to unite the community and bring about bipartisan cooperation. Before his tenure as governor, he gained national attention for his service as the U.S. Attorney for the District of New Jersey from 2002 to 2008. In this office, he crusaded against white-collar crime and public corruption, convicting 130 public officials engaged in bribery, fraud, and tax evasion. Throughout his governorship and afterwards, he has also been a notable figure in presidential politics. While his bids for the presidency in 2016 and 2024 ultimately fell short, his willingness to hold to his principles even when at odds with his party made him stand out from the lineup. Even after leaving office, he has been an outspoken and influential voice within the Republican Party. Governor Christie will be joined in discussion today by Leanne Caldwell, who is co-author of The Washington Post's Early 202 and anchor at The Washington Post Live. Before we begin, I'd just like to remind everyone to silence or turn off your cell phones. When it's time for Q&A, a microphone will be placed in the audience. When that happens, please line up, and as usual, we will give priority for the first questions to students. And finally, a quick plug for a few upcoming IOP events. On Thursday, April 25th, the IOP will host, will host hate, hate speech, asking who is censoring whom. That event will take place at Ida Noyes Cloister Club beginning at 5.30 p.m., and food will be provided. Then on Tuesday, April 30th, former Associate Attorney General and visiting IOP fellow Vanita Gupta will discuss justice in 2024 with the CNN's Evan Perez. That event will take place at Ida Noyes' third floor theater, and food will also be provided. Thank you for joining us, and please give a warm welcome to Governor Christie and Leanne Caldwell. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Governor, for joining us today. Um, let's just start a little reflective, if that's OK. We are, you're about three months since you suspended your presidential campaign. What are your thoughts about that now? What is there any sort of big takeaway that you have now than what you had three months ago? Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, I think when I, when I suspended the campaign, um, I did it for two reasons. One, we had finally come to the conclusion that we couldn't beat Trump in New Hampshire. And so if we couldn't beat Trump in New Hampshire, we weren't beating him anywhere. So the goal of a campaign is to win. And once you determine you can't, you know, why prolong the misery? Mm -hmm. um, and secondly, there was this buzz in the media about, oh, well, if, if Christie drops out, Nikki Haley yeah. can then beat Donald Trump. Now, we did a lot of polling, as you might imagine, and we knew that that was complete baloney. Hmm. That. Would it have changed, though, if you endorsed Nikki Haley? No. Why? My voters didn't care. Mm -hmm. um, their view about Nikki Haley had nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. It had to do with her. Um, mm -hmm. She just didn't, she didn't tell the truth about Trump. And so those voters were like, you know, when Nikki Haley said things like, for some reason, chaos and drama follow him wherever he goes. You know, that's like the arsonist saying, for some reason, burning buildings follow me wherever I go. I mean, <laughs> we know why, you set the fire. Um, and so people, and we had, depending on the poll, anywhere from like 15 to 17% of the primary electorate in New Hampshire. What we saw was that probably only four or 5% of the, of the 17 mm -hmm. were gonna vote for Haley. The rest of them said either I'm voting for Biden or I'm not voting at all. Okay. But what I knew from the media narrative, which was being ginned up by Governor Haley and by Governor Sununu, was that they wanted to blame me. They knew she was gonna lose, hmm. but they didn't want her to take the blame, they wanted me to take the blame. So I'm like, well, if I'm gonna lose anyway, why am I also gonna get blamed for Trump winning? Thank <laughs> you, since I'm the only one who's gone after Trump in the entire primary. So. I think that's the lesson of it, Leanne, is I think, I, and I came to this conclusion then, and it's the same one now. The Republican primary was effectively over mm -hmm. the night of the first debate. Why? Because Brett Baer asked all of us, if he's convicted of a felony, yeah. would you still support him? And six of the eight people on that stage raised their hands. 
including Nikki Haley, including Ron DeSantis, including Vivek Ramaswamy, including Mike Pence. Mm -hmm. And I went up to Pence afterwards and I said, how the hell do you expect anybody watching this debate tonight to be willing to consider voting for one of us if we're telling them what Trump did is okay? What did he say? Not much. <laughs> and, you know, to me, I didn't realize the, I knew it was important that night. I didn't realize it ended it. So we had 30 million people that night watching the debate. I would think most of those people were persuadables. If they were dead set on Trump, why would you watch? He wasn't there. Mm -hmm. um, so I would think most of them were persuadable. And what six of those eight people, it was just me and Asa Hutchinson who didn't raise our hands, six of those eight people were telling persuadable Republican primary voters this behavior is normal. Hmm. It's okay to have a nominee of a party for president of the United States be a criminal. Well, once you tell them that, like, how the hell do you expect them to then say, yeah, but I want you. So did they normalize then Trump's trials, Trump's, all the allegations For that period him? of time, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to stay that way, but I think for that period of time when the trials were just hypothetical yeah. and not real, they normalized it, but by that time, the primary was over. So, you know, that, I don't have any more profound yeah. thought on it, Leanne, but that is that you can't beat somebody without trying to beat them. So you kind of already answered this question, but I was talking to a lot of Republicans throughout this primary, um, some who worked for other campaigns as well, and saying, if you're kind of in this anti-Trump lane, why not come, more, come out more forcefully against him like you have? And everyone's response would always be, look at where Chris Christie is in the polls. Well, and so they were saying that you, it was not a winning message, and so they were trying to have it both ways and not yeah. alienate Trump voters. Well, that worked out really well, didn't it? <laughs> well, th point. Theirs was obviously a winning strategy, too. Look, there may not have been a winning strategy against Donald Trump in the primary this time. I, I don't know, but this much I do know. If eight people on that stage that first night, none of us had raised our hands, mm -hmm. it's a different story. Hmm. If every one of us was saying he is unfit, to be president of the United States by his character and his conduct. The voters start to hear it. They didn't have anything to hear except for me. Yeah. And I don't know. I mean, it seems to me, you know, I got triple the amount of vote in Iowa that I did in 2016. Hmm. I mean, I didn't win, but, but I didn't spend one day in Iowa, mm -hmm. not one. I think the power of the message would have been amplified if other people would have said it. And maybe one of them would have won. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that would have meant I would have won. Because we all come with our different baggage to every race. And you know, some people are still angry with me because I shook Barack Obama's hand 12 years ago during Hurricane Sandy. So those people, if they're still mad, they're definitely not voting for me. <laughs> um, but So I'm not saying that I would have won. But Trump might have lost. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that with the exception of Ramaswamy, I would have preferred any of those people over Trump. Hmm. Ramaswamy and Trump, I would have hoped for a death match <laughs> where they both die. A literal, a literal death yes. match. <laughs> where they both die. So a few minutes ago, you said that back then, at that point in time, that moment was really critical for the electorate. What about now? Trump has been in a Manhattan courtroom for the past week and a half. He's going to be for the foreseeable future. Do you think it's going to have any impact on the general election? If he's convicted, yes. Only if he's convicted. Yeah, I mean, look, if he's found not guilty, then you know he'll run around saying, see, it was all a witch hunt and blah, blah, blah. But look, I'll say two things about this. The first is about this particular experience he's having. Now, I spent seven years as a prosecutor. I was the United States attorney in New Jersey for seven years, the fifth largest U.S. attorney's office in the country, and a great place for crime. Yeah. <laughs> like, I used to compete with the U.S. attorney in Chicago on a regular basis on political corruption. We were, like, the political corruption epicenters, <laughs> New Jersey and Chicago. And Pat Fitzgerald was the U.S. attorney back then, and Pat and I used to compare notes all the time. Um, a criminal trial is a really awful thing to go through.
And if you look at Trump physically right now, he looks terrible. Mm -hmm. And it's because it is a horrible thing every morning to wake up knowing that your future is no longer in your control. Mm. It's in the control of 12 people you don't know. And so, you know, as this testimony comes out, like just what's happened in the last two days, I mean, you know, to know that, and we kind of assume this, but now you're hearing it under oath, that he had to deal with the National Enquirer to write bad stories about us, the people running against him in 16, and only good stories about him. Mm -hmm. And if there were any bad stories, that they would pay for them and conceal them. And that he was in the room and made that deal. And that the story about, remember, how, it was crazy, but it's the National Enquirer, right? Like, remember the story that, like, Ted Cruz's father was somehow involved with yeah. the Kennedy assassination. Yeah. And, and, and it's not totally crazy because it's a Cuban background. There's always been rumors about Castro and the Cubans maybe having been involved in the Kennedy assassination. But David Pecker, the publisher of the National Enquirer, said on the stand today that he made the entire thing up just to hurt Cruz to help Trump. So as this testimony comes out day after day after day, I think it will impact persuadable voters. Secondly, about Trump in particular, mm -hmm. in 2004, I was U.S. attorney, I was out to dinner with him, and I had just convicted the Senate president of the New Jersey State Senate of corruption, and he got sentenced to 27 months in prison. And Trump said to me, well, great job on that John Lynch case, amazing, you're the best, blah, 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 as you would expect Trump would say to somebody who could prosecute him. And, um, <laughs> and he, said, um, he said to me, so what happens to him now? And I said, well, Donald, you saw in the paper he got sentenced to 27 months. He goes, yeah, yeah, but what really happens to him? I said, well, what do you mean? <laughs> and he goes, well, a guy like him doesn't go to real prison, right? Mm. I said, oh no, he goes to real prison. Like he's been sentenced, he's got a month to report, he's gonna go to the Bureau of Prisons, I have nothing left to do with it. They decide where he goes, he could go anywhere in the country. And he reached over and grabbed my arm, we were sitting next to each other, and he said, oh my God, Chris, I could never do that. Hmm. I could never go to jail. They tell you when to go to bed at night and when to wake up in the morning and what to wear and what to do, who you can talk to and what you can eat. I, I, I could never do that. And he had this really ashen look on his face. And I said to him, well, don't get yourself in trouble and you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> I, as I watch him, all I can think about is that conversation. Hmm. Because he's trying to act like this doesn't bother him. Let me tell you, everybody, he is sick to his stomach every day because it is the thing. Thank you for the editorial comment. Um, <laughs> It is, it is one of the things, there's two things that Donald Trump fears more than anything, going to jail or being broke. Yeah. And so, you know, when that's what you really care about, being on trial for your life, while they've just tagged you for $530 million in, in penalties in the civil side, um, he's seeing both those things realize while he's also trying to run for president, which is a pretty hard thing. So I think this will have an effect on it. Not only because mm -hmm. it will change people's perceptions, but he'll be different, Leanne. Mm -hmm. That pressure is going to get to him, especially at 78 years old. Oh, yeah. Um, I want to ask you from a legal perspective. On Thursday, the Supreme Court's going to hear a case about presidential immunity and Donald Trump. Knowing what you know about the case, knowing what you know about the law and the Supreme Court justices, where do you think this case goes? Uh, look, I think that they rule against him for the most part. Mm -hmm. I think the reason they took it is because they've never given an opinion on this issue. And I think they want to make clear that if a president does certain things while conducting his office, for instance, if a president orders an attack like, we, like Trump did on Soleimani and he kills, orders the killing of General Soleimani of Iran in, um, in the Middle East, that he can't be prosecuted for that, mm -hmm. that that's part of what we expect. However, 
if he orders the murder of Chris Christie because he ran against him, that we can prosecute him on, <laughs> right? So I think the court wants to make the parameters of it clear, but I think in the end, it will not do anything to prevent him from being prosecuted in the current case, the January 6th case, the confidential documents case, hmm. or the case in Atlanta. I think they're not gonna make um, immunity that broad, but I think what they wanna do is make clear that there is some immunity for a president, but it has to be directly related to his job and duties, constitutional duties as president, which would include commander in chief. So I think that's what they'll do. Um, my guess is, um, I know Chief Justice Roberts fairly well. My guess is that that opinion is already being written mm -hmm. before the oral argument. Really? I don't think he's gonna let this linger. Um, and and I, I think he's already trying to craft as much as he can a 9-0 decision. Um, you know, he did it in the Trump ballot case, mm -hmm. even though there was a little bit of dissent, but not on the result. I think he's gonna, I think it's really important. You know, the court did it eight to zero on the Nixon tapes case back in the 70s. I think it was important. Um, if they can, for the court to speak with one voice. So I'm sure what he's trying to do is maneuver that so that they will, so there won't be any doubt in people's minds that liberals, conservatives on the court all agree that he can be prosecuted for this. Now, whether he's found guilty or not, it's going to be up to a jury. Mm -hmm. But I don't think the Supreme Court's going to stop it from happening. <laughs> Applaud for the Supreme Court uh, in, in hope. Um, <laughs> You said in August you were a candidate then, or I believe you were a candidate I was. then. Okay, so that if Trump was the nominee, he could not win a general election. Do you still believe that? Well, Biden's certainly making it harder. <laughs> um, you know, Heidi and I, Senator Heidkamp, were having this conversation before I came out here. I mean, look, Joe Biden's team around him, and I have to assume he acquiesces to this. Um, are so worried about the far left progressives mm -hmm. and, he's, and he's doing things to show that he's worried about them. I, my view on that is if I were running the Biden campaign, I'd be like, I'm not worried about them. They hate Trump so much that when push comes to shove and it's October, whatever misgivings they have about Biden, they're gonna be like, all right, but if I stay home, that's a vote for Trump and I'm not gonna do that. The people he has to keep are the people that he won in 2020. The educated, suburban, white women in suburban Milwaukee, suburban Detroit, suburban Philly, suburban Atlanta, and suburban Phoenix. Those five states, Trump won in 2016. Biden flipped all five of those states in 2020. That's why he won. And he won because white women who did not like Hillary Clinton in 2016, but couldn't say it out loud, mm -hmm. which is why Trump never led in the polls in those states, they went and go, we don't like her, and how bad could he be? And they voted for him. Then four years later, they learned just how bad he could be, and they went, okay, I can't do that anymore, and I don't love Biden, but I'll vote for Biden. The more he moves to the left mm -hmm. on issues like immigration, on, on issues like um, dealing with the problems that we have on campuses right now. The more he doesn't step up and do that, the more those women start going, not that they're gonna vote for Trump, but that they'll stay home. And them staying home is a death knell to him. So if you ask me to predict now what I think will happen, I still think Biden wins, but he is making it painfully close by kowtowing to a group of people who literally have no one else to vote for. Are, are cre really far left progressives going to vote for Robert F. Kennedy Jr.? Mm -hmm. I mean, the guy who says, like, Trump's an, a, a traitor because he, he authorized the COVID vaccine? Like, are progressives going to go, that's my guy right there? Yeah. Although I will tell you, we did some polling when I was considering the no labels thing. I, I, this was one of my questions. Well, I we'll, think, you, so. well I'll lead it into you. Right. I didn't even know. But when we did some polling, here's something really frightening that you will go home, and if you think about this, you'll be scared. There was a decent number of people when we asked them, and this was in 13 states we polled in, when we asked them about what they thought of Robert F. Kennedy Jr., mm -hmm. they said, 
we always loved President Kennedy's brother and we'd vote for him again. <laughs> now, now, Bobby's been dead for 55 years. <laughs> and there, so it's a window into voters in this country. There are some voters in this country who literally have no idea, none. Mm -hmm. And these are all people who said, I'm definitely voting. Because in a poll, if you don't say you're definitely voting, you, don't, you, you hang up and you move on to the next person. What was that percentage? Do you remember? It, you know, it wasn't 1% in any state, but it was f like we were, so 1% would be six people in a particular state. It was three or four people, but it happened in like six or seven states. Mm -hmm. I, 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 like, look, I'm from New Jersey, so I'm surrounded by some people who aren't that smart, but I, <laughs> it's true, it's my state, I love them, but you know, <laughs> think about this. Like, there are three or four people that we polled, which statistically means there's more, who think Robert F. Kennedy is still alive and running for president. Stunning. So on that polling then, did you also find uh, a third party candidate would benefit Trump or Biden more? Depends on the state. Mm -hmm. But um, generally speaking, would benefit Trump more. Okay, so spoiler for Biden. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not by a lot, mm -hmm. but by enough that I think it was significant. Um, but what you really find about it is, in 13 states, we asked the question, would you consider voting for a third party independent candidate against either Trump or Biden? The lowest we got in the 13 states was 65%. The highest we got was 72%. So now you're thinking, hey, maybe this third party thing works, right? Mm -hmm. And then you get to giving names. Nobody that we, we put a name by, including me, got higher than 17%. Hmm. So what happens is they love the idea of someone other than Trump or Biden, but then if you say, Senator Heidi Heitkamp, they go, oh, well, <laughs> I'm not so sure. And then they say, well, okay, maybe they don't like Democrats. What about Governor Chris Christie? Yeah, no, no, I don't like him either. What about Joe Manchin? No, no, we don't like him. What about Nikki Haley? No, no, not her. Like who? Like, I really think that in today's America, like Dwayne The Rock Johnson would have been like the only person that would have gotten over 20. Um, because people look at him and don't put any philosophy on him. But once you get a philosophy, Republican or Democrat, put on you, they don't, they don't want to hear it. And so when we looked at it, and we looked at it pretty closely, there was no path to winning. And that's why you declined to yeah, do it? I lost once, don't want to lose twice, you know? Like, um, and I, and I just really felt, Leanne, that like, if there wasn't a path to winning, and if I wound up hurting Biden more than I hurt Trump, and I helped elect Trump, yeah, there's certain things I'm willing to live with. That's not one of them. Mm. Would you vote for Biden? I don't think so. No. RFK Jr.? <laughs> no, look, I, right now, look, things can change because campaigns matter. The one thing I know for sure now is I am not voting for Trump under any circumstances. If he's the only person on the ballot, I'm not voting for Trump because I know him too well. And, and he is wholly unfit to be president of the United States in every way you can think of. Um, but, but President Biden, in my view, is past his sell-by date. I mean, but there's come no on, other... really, seriously, look at him. But there's no other and option. listen to him. Well, look, voting is a right, and I treasure my right to vote. Mm -hmm. But if the American people are stupid enough to nominate these two guys, it doesn't mean I have to be stupid too. And I have a number of other races that'll be on the ballot below president in my state. We have a United States Senate race. We, we have our, all of our House races. We have county races and local races. I'll vote in all of them. But 
I, right now, I couldn't say to myself, I think Joe Biden is capable of being president today, let alone at 86. I mean, everybody, take a breath. He's going to be four years older. He, it's not like they say to you when you get past 85, okay, you only have to be president three days a week. <laughs> you can go to Delaware the rest of the time, take time off. No. President is 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and I don't believe the man's up to it. And that's not a, an observation on his intellect. That's an observation on his age and how the aging process has affected him. But if you say that you can't live with yourself if you help to elect Donald Trump, is doing nothing equivalent to that? Not in New Jersey. Not in New Jersey. Well, but, but that's where I vote, voters. Leanne. Right, I mean, but, you know. But voters elsewhere, voters in battleground states who They'll might. have to make that choice. I'm glad I'm free from having to make that choice. I wouldn't know what the hell to do. I'm being honest with you. And I, and I know both of them personally. I'm, I've known Joe Biden longer than I've known Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. I was the president of the student body at the University of Delaware. Joe Biden's alma mater. He was there every Saturday for the home football games. I met him drinking beer at a tailgate when I was 20. The drinking age was 20 in Delaware then. <laughs> just how old I am but and we've stayed in touch over the years um, I like Joe Biden personally I think he's a really good person but look my youngest daughter is here today she's a junior at, at Notre Dame and uh, if I were Joe Biden I would expect her as someone who loves me to come and put her hand on my shoulder and say, Dad, you did a great thing. You saved the country from Donald Trump. I'm really proud of you, but it's time to go home. Mm -hmm. And I think if his family really loved him, that's what they would do. But instead, and this is both families now, the Trump family and the Biden family, they are both on the grift. Valerie Biden, Jim Biden, Hunter Biden, all they've done for the last 40 years has made, have made money because their last name is Biden. And that's all the that Trumps do, is make money because their last name is Trump. I, this is what I really believe, and I, and I apologize to any members of the baby boomer generation in this audience, but Joe Biden and Donald Trump represent, in my view, the last gasp of the most selfish generation in American history the baby boomers. They were given this country by the greatest generation in our history, the World War II generation, and they believe everything is about them. They've been the most entitled generation this country has ever seen. They have lived in the freest, richest time in this country's history, and they won't go away. <laughs> and it's time for them to go away. Look. You're obviously not running for president. Not right now, but, but let me say this. You know, maybe we need to be saying this to these people, Leanne. Maybe it's time to be honest. I mean, the fact is, and this doesn't apply to every person in the generation, but let me tell you, look at these people. You think they don't look in the mirror and know, but they want the power. They want the attention. They want the prestige. They want the attention. And, and, and I think that they are ill-serving the country. And this applies to Trump and Biden. They're both of the same generation. And in this way, just in this way, from a personality perspective, I think they're startlingly the same. And their families have learned from them. Hmm. I'll give you one quick story. Um, in 2016, I was helping Donald Trump, and I helped to prepare him for the commander-in-chief interviews, which were interviews that were done by Matt Lauer of both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton, purely about military issues. And after I got done prepping him for this, I was getting ready to leave, and Trump's secretary said to me, Don Jr. wants to have a quick word with you on your way out. So I swung by Don Jr.'s office, and he said, look, can you go with him tonight to this thing? And I said, no, 
I was like the sitting governor. I'm like, no, I can prep him. I'm not going and staffing him. No. And, and he said, no, but, but you should go because when he's with you, he doesn't tweet as much. <laughs> and I said, you know, with all due respect, how come I have to be the guy? Why don't you do it? And he looked at me and said, because I'm in the will and you never will be. Now, I want you to think about not what that says about Don Jr. That's the obvious one. Think about what that says about Donald Trump. That his own son thinks that if he tells the truth to his father, that the result could be he's cut out of the will. This is what I'm talking about, everybody, that you have these two men running for president, one who is president, one who's been president, both who are running for president, who have set that kind of ethos that Hunter Biden thinks all the crap he was doing was okay because he was Joe Biden's son. The worst thing that ever happened to Joe Biden, both as a father and as a leader, was his son Bo dying. Because I knew Bo pretty well. I was U.S. Attorney in New Jersey when Bo was the Attorney General in Delaware, and we did cases together. And that was a great person. And he's the one who said on his deathbed to his father, promise me you'll run. Don't end your career here. And I, I am willing to bet, I don't know, but I'm willing to bet that if Bo were alive today, Joe Biden would have done what I believe he should have done a year ago. We just get up and say I was a transitional figure. I saved the country from Donald Trump. I did this, 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 and this that he's proud of in his presidency. But it's now time for me to go home and turn the leadership of the country over to the next generation. And if Joe Biden had done that, the American people in mass would have carried him out of the White House on their shoulders. He would have been a Washington-type figure for walking away from power because he's putting the country ahead of his own interests. And he missed that opportunity, and I think it's, it's, it's making this race close, and it's costing the country in a way that I think is really sad. Has Joe Biden, has President Biden reached out to you recently, asked for his support? No. Or your support? He no. hasn't. Uh uh Should he? It's pretty stupid for him not to. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Yeah. Right? I mean, look, like when you're running for office, unless the person like morally repulses you, and even then, if it's close, <laughs> you're asking for their vote. Mm -hmm. You know, President Bush 43 one time said to me when I was running for governor the first time, he called to give me advice and he said to me, one last thing, buddy. Remember, ask for the vote. You know, you show up in front of these groups, they all think, you think, well, they know I want their vote. People like to be asked. Look at them and say, I want your vote. Ask for the vote. If this were George W. Bush, man, my phone would have rung five minutes after I got out of the race. Hmm. And I don't know what's going on. I, I, I have to believe it's philosophical with his staff. Hmm. And they don't want to go there because they're concerned about the far left. Well, God, what if we, you know, go and ask for support from an antichrist like a Republican? This is the problem with the country. And, um, you know, uh, John McCain was great friends with Joe Lieberman. And if John McCain had followed his own instincts, and it asked Joe Lieberman to be his vice president, which is what he wanted to do, rather than Sarah Palin. Um, I don't know that Obama would have lost to McCain, but it would have been a lot closer. We need to be working together, and it would be a smart thing for Biden to do, but uh, he hasn't so, done it. so far, so no. Far. And I know- The invitation is open. And I know he's got my number because right after he was elected, I said some positive things on ABC, and I got in the car to head back to New Jersey, and he called hmm. and said, I, I listened to what you said. Thank you so much. Important for Republicans to be saying that. So he's got the number. I haven't changed it. So, <laughs> Is, uh, so do you plan on being at either convention this summer? <laughs> I don't. Look, I, I treasure my life. Um, <laughs> so I don't think I'm going to the the. Uh, Trump convention in Milwaukee. Don't think I'll be asked to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and on the Biden convention, I, you know, I've never been to a Democratic convention in my life, so I can't imagine, despite the fact that it's 
in this beautiful city, um, I don't think I'll be invited. And if I were, I would feel a little bit out of place under current circumstances. You sound a little open. <laughs> See, this is the problem with politics today. If you don't say hell no, they go, oh, so you didn't rule it out, did you? <laughs> um, I, I, I expect to be either sitting at home with Mary Pat, watching the conventions on TV, or if I'm back working for ABC, being on TV and, and giving commentary on the conventions. But I do not expect to participate in any way at all. What is your biggest fear if Donald Trump were elected? re-elected that he will surround himself with yes people and sycophants who will not tell him that he can't do certain things um, I was around a lot in the four years that he was president and he had a lot of people around him who said no you can't do that mm -hmm. and if he continued to persist would say if you do that I'm resigning and then he would go all right all right I won't do it there won't be any of those people this time just won't think about this he had 44 people who either served in his cabinet or at a cabinet level staff position. 44 in his four years. 40 of them have said not only would they ever work for him again, they won't vote for him. So who are the people who are going to go into that? Like, and, and then, you know, uh, when, when General Kelly was made chief of staff, he called me and said, you know, Everybody around here says, you know Trump better than anybody. Can you come down and have lunch with me and give me some advice about how to deal with him personally? And I said, I, look, General, I'd be happy to have lunch with you anytime, but I can give you the advice right now in 45 seconds. And he said, okay, I'm a general. I like efficiency. Mm -hmm. And I said, today you are trading at 100 cents on the dollar. You will trade to zero. The only question is how long will it take? And when you trade to zero, he will trash you on the way out. And if you look at every good person who has worked for him, that's what he's done to every one of them. From John Kelly and Reince Priebus to Bill Barr and, and, and you know, uh, Mark Esper and General Mattis and um, Rex Tillerson. And you go through the list. And so my biggest fear is that there'll be no one around to put guardrails up and he will be on the vendetta tour. Hmm. Mm -hmm. against all enemies that he perceives. And that's a scary thing for the country, um, not only for the harm that it will cause, but also for the things that we need to do that we won't be doing because he'll be spending time just trying to screw everybody that he doesn't like. And, you know, it's not just the act of doing it. It's all the things you don't do that need to be done for this country by the president. And, and I think that, you know, that's the thing that I fear the most. If he does not win, do you think he will accept the results of the election? No. What do you see, foresee happening? How will it be different than it was last time? Well, he's not president. So he can yell all he wants, but he's got no ability to do anything about it. Do you worry about political violence? Well, I think you'd have to after January 6th. But I also think that a bunch of those January 6th folks rightfully going to jail will make other people go, eh. Mm -hmm. When Donald Trump says, I'll follow you up to Capitol Hill, don't believe him. <laughs> He's not going to. This is a guy, remember, this is a guy who got out of military service because he had bone spurs in his heels. This is a guy who breaking a fingernail is a traumatic event. He's not putting himself in harm's way for anybody. Mm -hmm. And so the idea that somehow other people will follow into violence, it, there may be. But I do think that the example that was set on January 6th by law enforcement in the aftermath, uh, where you just saw another person sentenced to a long sentence who was part of the Proud Boys who helped to organize some of that. Um, law, the law enforcement system has worked in the main um, in the aftermath of January 6th. And, and I think that that will set a deterrent value to a lot of people. Could there be some violence? Sure, there could be. But remember, he's not president anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and that is the biggest difference. He has no levers of power available to him. And now he will be a two-time loser. And I think people start to go, oh, really? He's not going to be president again. And, you know, I don't know that he'll go away, mm -hmm. Leanne. I don't think he can. I don't think his ego is such that he can't 
not have the attention. He is like the equivalent of a heroin addict to attention. And he's now had the strongest heroin he could ever have. He's president of the United States. So that every utterance he makes is paid attention to by the whole world. And now he's back at Mar-a-Lago playing golf. And he's like, what the hell is this? I don't like this. So I don't know that he'll ever go away, but I don't think he can do what he did four years ago because he's not gonna have the levers of power available to him to do it. And um, so I think he won't accept it. He'll say it's rigged and it's fixed, and um, that's just his way. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't think it'll have anywhere near the impact on the country that it did four years ago when mm -hmm. he was sitting in the White House. What was the moment that you had a shift in opinion or position about him? Election night 2020. Look, I, was, I didn't like Hillary Clinton at all, and I thought she was going to be horrible for the country. And that's why I supported Trump. Because remember, I ran against Trump in 2016. He was not my first choice for president. I was. Um, <laughs> that didn't work out. And I didn't want Hillary Clinton to be president. I thought she'd be an awful president, and I didn't want her. So I'm like, okay, well, he's the person who's going to be left. So my thought at the time was, since we've known each other for a long time, I can help make him better. And I owe it to the country to go and do this. And I can make it better. And I think if you talk to Rex Tillerson or Bill Barr or you know, Mark Esper or General Mattis or General Kelly, they all felt the same way. None of us loved him. None of us thought like, oh yeah, Mount Rushmore, clear space. Like, <laughs> but I think all of us felt like we could help to make it better. Um, and that was my effort during those four years but as Heidi will tell you, I saw on ABC a lot of Sundays and criticized him when I thought he was doing something wrong. And I would get screamed at by him in the car on the way out. Um, but that was fine. And I used to remind him when he'd call me, like, I don't work for you. So I'm allowed to say whatever I want. Um, and that's why I never took a job with him, despite being offered four different cabinet positions and White House chief of staff. But on election night, when he came out at 2.30 in the morning and said, I won the election, the election is fixed. I turned to George Stephanopoulos and I said, come to me first when he's done. And he said, why? And I said, I won't disappoint you. <laughs> so he came to me first and I just plowed Trump over and said this is an abomination, it's beneath the office that he's been privileged to hold and that this is it. I can't support anybody any further who is willing to lie to the American people about something as precious as our election results. And so that's it. I was done then. And mm -hmm. we haven't spoken since November of 2020. OK. So we're going to open up to questions. There's a microphone in the center of the room so you could line up, ask one more question while people get settled. And that is, have you spoken to Mike Pence since the Republican primary? Yeah, a few times. How's that, how's that relationship? I, look, I like Mike a lot, and, and I admire what, first of all, I admire what Mike did on January 6th. Mm -hmm. um, he did the right thing, and he upheld his loyalty to the country and his duty to the Constitution, and I think he deserves great credit for that. Um, so in that, I have great respect for him. And he eventually came around during the campaign. In the beginning, he's trying to do the mm -hmm. same thing that all those really smart yeah. people were telling you. He's <laughs> trying to thread the needle and have it both ways. And he eventually concluded, you can't. And unlike someone like Bill Barr, who's just recently said he's going to support Trump, which I, I'm dumbfounded by, Mike Pence has said flat out, I will not support Trump. I will not vote for him. Mm -hmm. And so Mike and I have always gotten along well. When Mike ran for governor the first time in 2012, um, I was a big supporter of his, came out and campaigned for him, raised money for him, um, and I consider him a friend. Um, and, and I think he's a good man who got caught into a bad situation in a lousy job where you don't really have any choice but to be loyal and didn't know how to get himself out of it. And really, January 6th was a declaration of independence for him. Mm. And I think he probably... If you asked Mike if he was sitting here, he'd probably say he's never felt better than he feels right now.
hmm. because I think he's being true to himself for the first time in a long time. Hmm. Interesting. Great. We'll start right here. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Marco Suproniuk. I'm a student at the business school here, and um, I'm a partisan Democrat. And I'm, I'm old enough to say that I have followed your career governor for 15 years, and over that time, I've seen you support Donald Trump. I've seen you uh, and heard you say a lot of you know negative things about ideas that I believe in and people I believe in, and you know how to be a jerk about it. But I hate to say, I still have a lot of respect for you, and I love You'll get over it, don't worry about it. I, I love hearing from you, and I, I like you. So what makes you so damn likable, and what lessons can other politicians learn from you? Oh, you know, it's the Jersey thing. Um, <laughs> look, um, I've grown up a lot, too, in the last 15 years. You know, when I got elected governor in 2009, I was 47 years old. Um, it was my first major political office. And you know, I think I've learned a lot over that time. There's things that I've said in the past that if I had to do over again, I wouldn't say. Um, and I think anybody in public life who tells you otherwise is full of it. Like, I wasn't perfect, I'm not perfect today. But I think what I am is genuine. Like, what you see is what you get. And like, maybe you like it, maybe you don't. That's okay. Um, I don't take offense from the people who don't like me or disagree with me. And if I've said something um, negative about views that you hold dear, it's just because I hold different views dearly. And so I'm going to say what I believe. But in the end, I think that more than anything else, I've just tried to be myself. And I think if you do that, you gain respect from a good number of people. But what you also have to be ready for in this business is, like, if 51% of the people like you, you're a legend. <laughs> a legend. And so you can't worry about that stuff. And, and I, I appreciate your honesty, you know? And I think that in the end, for me, what my career, what I've tried to make my career about is actually getting things done. And whatever I need to do to get things done, if I have to rebuild my state after the second worst natural disaster in this country's history, and that means that I'm working with a whole bunch of Democrats who on other stuff I don't agree with, that's what I have to do. And even if you're Mitt Romney's keynote speaker <laughs> and the election's six days away and Barack Obama lands in your state, I, I still find it stunning. What do people want me to do? Like wear, greet them wearing my Romney sweatshirt? I mean, like... <laughs> You know, you have a job to do for the people who elected you. And I think that those kind of things are probably part of the reason why you can't completely dislike me. Um, Thank you. And so that's a win for me. Great. Uh, is, there, is there a question in the balcony? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hi, Governor Christie. My name is Ali. I'm a fourth year in the college, and I serve on the student advisory board here at the Institute of Politics. Thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. So I have a question for you, which is that you, like Governor John Kasich, believes that Donald Trump poses an existential threat to our democracy. Unlike him, you have not chosen to show up to the convention as Governor Kasich did in 2020, endorse Biden, rally for Biden, believe in Biden as much as he has. So I'm wondering what's stopping you from supporting the President Biden fully if you truly believe the threat is so great? Don't you think you could convince some voters in swing states who are Republicans to vote for President Biden? Because I don't believe in Joe Biden. I mean, it's really that simple. Um, I don't believe in Biden. And I don't believe he has the physical or psychological capability to serve another four years as president. It's really not more complicated than that. I've said I like him personally, and I do. Um, but he's too old. That's it. And like, you know, I hear somebody say, well, what's the alternative? Well, I didn't pick the alternatives. You all did. And so, okay. It doesn't mean I have, we don't have a law that says you must vote for someone even if the two options repel you. Part of the freedom to vote is the freedom to not vote. And I'm being as honest as I can be with you. Like, I wish, I pray Joe Biden were better 
so that I could vote for him because I want to vote, but I can't. Now, that's my view. There are others who have a different view of it and see it as a binary choice that is inescapable. I'm not going to criticize somebody for that, but I can't do it. I know them both too well. And I don't know who Trump's going to pick for vice president, but we better look closely at both vice presidential candidates because neither one of these guys is immune from not being able to serve the entire four years, either because of death or disability. So, you know, those are, and I will say flat out, I, have, I think Kamala Harris has no business being president of the United States. So that's, you want to know exactly why? That's why. Can't do it. Uh, hello, my name is Jacob Steinberg. I'm a second year in the college, uh, vice president of UC Dems, and a committee member with Chicago Style here at the IOP. Uh, and to kind of continue to push on this question, uh, you've implied that Biden's age has currently impacted his service. I haven't implied it. I've said it. Well, yeah, you've said it then. But but that's been that's been a core argument. So I would I I, I would like to hear you uh, iterate more. What about Biden's age has impacted his service? What about Biden poses a threat that is equal to or within the range of the massive de demo dem democracy threatening level threats uh, that you see Trump posing? First of all, I, I reject the premise of the question. They don't have to be equivalent. You say they have to be equivalent. I, I don't. So that's the first thing. The premise of the question is flawed in my view. But secondly, let me be really clear. He can't function as president in a way we need a president to function. He can't sell his policies. Why do you think his approval ratings are in the high 30s and low 40s? He can't sell it. I'm not saying he's senile. I'm not a doctor. I have no way to be able to diagnose him. I'm not qualified to do that, but I am qualified to, to uh, diagnose him as a politician. And he can't sell it. If you aren't beating Donald Trump by 10 points, something's wrong. And what's wrong is you can't sell you. And you want specifics. When he shuffles up to the podium, he looks like he's going to the early bird special and not to the podium for the president of the United States. When he gives ridiculous answers, nonsense answers that we've all heard him give that do not comport with reality, you wonder how his mind's working. When his staff appears to not want to put him out in public because they're afraid of what he might say, that's not a person who's qualified to be president. He turned down the Super Bowl interview. And the Super Bowl interview wasn't with Fox. It was with CBS. I think it would have been fairly sympathetic. But they couldn't put him out there. He did a press conference with the Prime Minister of Japan the other day and had a teleprompter. I don't want a president who can only give answers if they put the answers up on the screen in front of him. Let me just follow so up I, on like, I, You know... You want it to be the equivalent of Donald Trump. Bad is bad. Unqualified is unqualified. And I've done this work. And I can tell you, most 82-year-old men or women are not up to being president of the United States. And in his instance, age has ravaged him more. And for obvious reasons, by the way. The guy's had two brain surgeries in his life already. He's lost his wife. He's lost two children. These are traumatic events in people's lives that are incredibly difficult to get over and stay with you. So I, I'm not saying that Joe Biden's a bad person. I said earlier, I like him. I think he's a good person. But my dad's 91 years old. And he drives. He's totally with it dating a 74-year-old woman, which should give hope to everybody. Um, but
but I wouldn't want my dad within five miles of the White House because the stress and strain and responsibility and demands of that job would end him. It's just what age does to us. I'm not as good as I was from an energy perspective when I got elected governor now 15 years ago. I'm just not. I'm not bad, but I'm 61 as opposed to 46. It's just life, and I know you'd like it to be different, but it's not. Is there a specific instance in Biden's presidency, though, a policy specific, not a verbal or messaging thing, that was because of his age or a decision he made that no, because of his age? No, because he doesn't make those decisions. His staff does. I mean, come on. Can we be real about this? I was a governor. So much of what got put out was approved by me, but was put out by my staff. Mm -hmm. Was decisions that we all made together and that I signed off on. But so no, I can't point to a particular decision, but I could point to dozens of times in public when it is the, one of the president's jobs is to make those decisions on policy and then go sell them. Mm -hmm. He can't sell them. They don't send him out there to do it. Let me make a comparison to two other Democratic presidents. So this is not a partisan thing. Bill Clinton could sell snow to Eskimos. <laughs> and they would buy more than they ever bought in their entire lives. The guy is the single best retail politician of my lifetime. He's the best. That's a president. Mm -hmm. Barack Obama. Now, there were moments when Obama was aloof, but when Obama wanted to turn on the charm, he did it, and he was damn good at it. And I'll go Republican, too. George W. Bush was mocked when he ran for president. But man, when 9-11 came, the country supported him because they looked in his eyes and saw two things. The pain he was feeling for his country, he didn't hesitate to show tears in his eyes and choke up when he was talking about it, and the strength to go out there and lead the fight. That's regardless of what you thought of his policies or anything else. That's a huge part of the presidency. And if you can't do that, then your policies don't get instituted because you know, folks on Capitol Hill respond to the leadership of a president, and they respond to how a president can move the public so that even if they disagree with him, they might vote that way because they're like, oh, God, you know, 65% of the people at home want me to do this, and shit, I, I guess I have to do it even if I don't want to. That's what we miss when we don't have a president who can sell it. And so it's practical. It's a practical requirement of the job to do it at the highest level. Great. Uh, I think, is there a balcony question? Hi, Governor. Thank you for your time today. Uh, I'm a second year Master of Public Policy student here. I was just curious to know who is your preferred Republican nominee for president from the candidates that ran this year? You mean other than Trump? Yes. Me. <laughs> <laughs> it's the easiest question of the night. <laughs> I would vote for me. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and I will say, um, since you're going to give me more time to talk about me, I, um, <laughs> I'm much better prepared to be president today than I was eight years ago when I ran the first time. And I think I would have been a better president this time than I would have been eight years ago. But that's not the way it works. So, you know, we got these two guys. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Right here. Hello, Governor. Thank you for being here with us tonight. My name's Anna Stupinyan. I'm a second year undergrad here at the college, and I've been a lifelong New Jersey resident. All right, where from? Summit. All right, in the neighborhood. <laughs> I'm in Mendham, so we're close. Um, my question to you is, what is your sense of the future of the Republican Party, especially if Trump wins this election? Um, is there any going back for the Sure. 
Look, I, I am, I'm one of those who believes that this is unique to him. There is no one else who can keep this coalition together. No shot. You know, Ron DeSantis played around this spring with trying to keep the coalition together. No chance. This is unique to Trump and unique to this moment in our history. We are, we have become a celebrity culture. You cannot explain the Kardashians in any other way. <laughs> These are people who are famous for being famous. And when you ask why they're famous, they go, because I'm famous. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying that they are completely without skill, but come on, all right? Trump, remember this, in the TV age, so from a presidential elections perspective, from 1952 forward, there have only been two candidates for president who were not already president, who came into their election with 100% name ID among the public, Dwight Eisenhower and Donald Trump, for totally different reasons. <laughs> Dwight Eisenhower beat the Axis in World War II. Donald Trump sat on a fake set in Trump Tower and said, you're fired. <laughs> and he is the only person by personality and fame who could hold this together. So I think what will happen is that that coalition will splinter among a bunch of other candidates in 28. And I don't know where it lands, but this 40% or so of our party who is solidly behind what they call MAGA, it's Trump. And when he goes, they won't go, some will, but they'll splinter. Because I haven't met the person yet who could do what he does and, and get away with what he gets away with. Um, no one else will be held to that lowest standard. <laughs> and, and I think that, so I think our party will become something different whether he wins or loses after 28. But what it will become is gonna be up to us. That's the good thing and the scary thing. Mm -hmm. It's up to us. Thank you. Sure. Up there. Oh. Hello, uh, thank you for coming uh, to speak with us today. Um, kind of on a similar note, looking towards like 2028, both on the Republican side and also on the Democratic side, uh, where do you see the leading candidates kind of coming from? Do you think it's going to be the Ramaswamis and the more extreme or Ocasio-Cortez on the other side? Or do you see it being other candidates who are more unifying? No idea. Anybody who tells you they do is full of it. No idea. Uh, let me ask you this. If I was sitting up here 10 years ago, and you would ask that question. I said, well, Donald Trump <laughs> is going to dominate the next decade of American life. They would have like had me taken out of here. <laughs> um, look, it's both the concerning thing and exhilarating thing about our democracy. 35 years of age, natural born American citizen. That's it. Those are the two qualifications. And we are pushing the edge of that um, <laughs> right now. So I have no idea. Um, the one thing I will guarantee you is Nikki Haley will run. <laughs> Take it to the bank. She will run. And she will stand for just as little as she stood for this time. <laughs> right here in the blue sweatshirt or sweater. Hi, Governor, thank you. I'm Nihar, I'm a first year MBA. Um, what do you think about today's Republican Party having a majority in the Senate or even maintaining it in the House? Do you see any problems with that? I don't, but Heidi does. <laughs> um, look, I, I think it depends on, as with everything, it depends on who gets elected. Um, but you're having a change of leadership um, in the Senate. You know, Senator McConnell is not going to be the leader any longer, and I think you'll wind up with either Senator Cornyn or Senator Thune, um, both of whom I think is, will be a welcome change from, from Senator McConnell. Um, on the Democratic side, I think, unfortunately, it'll continue to be Senator Schumer, who I've known for a long time. Um, <laughs> let's just leave it at that. Um, 
I, I will say this about Chuck, though. He is an amazing political story. Because if you talk to individual, which I have, members of the Democratic Senate caucus, none of them like him. I'm like, how did he win? Like, and he won, I think, by just relentlessly, relentlessly wanting to win. And just wore them down. Just wore them down. All oh, right, already. Chuck, take it. Like, just shut up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so, I, like, you know, on the Republican side, look, if somebody like Larry Hogan wins in Maryland, that's a good thing for the party and it's a good thing for the country because he will replace Joe Manchin as a voice of reason who will vote for what he believes in and not just necessarily vote with his party. So I think anybody who believes in bipartisanship should be rooting for Larry Hogan. Um, the same way I rooted for Joe Manchin all those years. I got, I, I've known Joe for 15 years, and I have enormous respect for him. Um, now, he's a politician, and he'll make deals, and Joe's not pure by any stretch, but none of us are. The fact is that he was willing, though, to listen to the other side and to press for things that he thought were unifying for the country. And I will say this. I had almost no expectations for Speaker Johnson. Mm. Almost none. And I have to tell you, what he did this week, he should be commended for. He really should be. Um, fact is, he has put his job on the line. And that's a key moment for every politician in a position of leadership. What are you willing to lose your job over? And Mike Johnson showed us this week that he was willing to lose his job over America's role as the leader of the free world. And he deserves great credit for that. So, you know, um, I think he encourages me a little bit, more than I ever thought he would, based off what he did um, this past week. And uh, I think this gives him the chance to be a speaker of consequence. And that's a good thing, and something that Kevin McCarthy will never be, because he caved. And um, when you cave that many times, they eventually kick you out anyway. Mm -hmm. So why not stand up for something you believe in? I think Mike Johnson did that this week. And by the way, I will also say, I think Hakeem Jeffries showed leadership as well by not saying to his caucus, don't vote for anything Johnson's for. I think that was a good display of, of leadership by Jeffries also. And I think that gives me a little hope for what perhaps could happen, um, no matter who has the majority in the House after 24, and I think it's more likely they're not going to be the Democrats, um, just on the way the map kind of lays out. So um, I think we'll probably have split government just the flip way. I think the Republicans probably take the Senate, Democrats probably take the House. So whoever the next president is, is going to have to decide, do I want to actually get something done, or do I want to continue gridlock? And with the two guys we have, can't say I'm encouraged that either one of them will pick anything other than gridlock. Mm -hmm. Right here. Uh, Leanne and uh, Governor Christie, thank you so much for uh, coming to our, our fair city. Um, my name is Mike Donahue. I went to, I was in school even before Gov Governor Christie was in school. Um, but I do have one question for, for the governor, and I mean this with all due respect. Um, uh, governor, do you have any regrets whatsoever over being somewhat of an enabler to Trump from 2016 to 2020? Sure, I've said it. I, I regret supporting him. It was the wrong decision. I mean, I've explained why I did it, but I've said publicly a number of times before that it was the wrong decision. Um, now, by saying that, I want to make sure I'm really clear with all of you. That doesn't mean it would have been the right decision to support Hillary. Again, we were left with awful choices. I mean, I don't think we've had a good choice in a presidential election since Obama and Romney, who I think either one of them would have been a president who respects our institutions and who tells the truth as they see it. I didn't agree with President Obama on a lot of things, but I believe Barack Obama 
told the truth as he saw it. And I think Mitt Romney, if he had become president, would have done the same thing. I think 2012 was the last election where we had two people who we could be proud of as the nominees. And we've now gone three cycles in a row where I think that's really open to question. So I want to be clear. Um, it was a mistake, but it was a mistake because I thought I could make Donald Trump better. And that was my mistake in judgment. I couldn't, and I didn't. And so um, it was a waste of my time. Mm -hmm. Sir, last question right here. Thank you so much, Governor. Um, I live and work on the south side now, but originally grew up right over on the other side of the border in Allentown, Pennsylvania. Not Allentown, New Jersey, I'm sorry. It's all right. Um, so I really felt that, that, that dig you took at New Jerseyans uh, from the other side of the border. Um, but, but we also love they New Jersey. They voted for me twice. They, they're yeah. over it. They're okay. <laughs> well, you have the shore, too. We don't. That's yes. the one downside to Pennsylvania. Well, um, I wanted to ask. I'll leave just, that alone. <laughs> appreciate it. Um, I wanted to ask just a lot of the conversations that I have with my neighbors on the south side and, um, and other people in the black community uh, have to do a lot with the characterization of both Trump and Biden. And I appreciate so much your personal relationship and the insights you provided us on both of them. Um, but I, I had a question about one thing particularly. You mentioned Biden's age, and that's something we talk about a lot. But one of the things that also comes up a lot in our community is we're worried about his history of comments on race, um, specifically things he said, like describing Barack Obama as the first mainstream African-American who was articulate, bright, clean, and a nice-looking guy, saying that Mitt Romney was going to put you all back in chains, saying that poor kids like I grew up are just as smart and just as talented as white kids, that if you don't know who you support, that you're not black, that we're a monolith, um, that he was afraid of sending his kids to a racial jungle. And these things all um, made me a little bit uncomfortable with the characterization of him as a good man. However, you know him, so if I'm wrong, please let me know. I think that would be something that a lot of us here in Chicago would really appreciate knowing more about. Yeah, I, I've known Joe Biden for a long time, and I don't believe Joe Biden has a racist bone in his body. What I think is that Joe Biden doesn't think before he talks often. Um, and, and, and by the way, that's not his age. He was doing that at 30. Okay, so... Joe Biden is a guy who speaks first, thinks second. He's like ready, fire, aim. <laughs> and, and that's been, when you look at Joe Biden's political career, what has held him back? You know, plagiarizing Neil Kinnock's speech when he ran for president the first time. Not being completely honest about his academic record at Syracuse Law School. Um, we could go on and on with these different, like, you know, Joe Biden's stories of legend that, you know, turn out not to be true, right? Including this most recent one that he's done about cannibalism and, you know, like you go, what? <laughs> you know, um, I think that, frankly, those comments were more generational than they were racist. He thought he's being complimentary to Barack Obama. He, his generation, at least some members of his generation, didn't understand how that could make you feel like he believes someone who's African American is lesser. When he said, Mitt Romney's going to put you all back in chains, he thought that that was a rhetorical flourish that was at least somewhat representative of the policies Romney would put in place, not to literally put you in chains, but that he would set back the cause of African-American advancement in this country. I, I, you know, it was the wrong way to put it. And I'm not making excuses for him, I'm trying to explain it. I, I, like I said, I've known Biden for 40 years. I think that in his heart, he's somebody who really cares about people and really wants to use public service as a way to improve the circumstances of as many people as he possibly can in this country. Um, and I don't see anything racist about him at all um, in my experience with him. Um, but <laughs> you have to own the things you say. And I do think that he's been penalized over time politically for some of the things that you, that you mentioned 
and there are others, as you know. For brevity's sake, I'm sure you cut it off. But um, look, all of us who have an open microphone on a national level are going to sometimes say things that we wish we wouldn't have. And I said that earlier about myself, like with the guy who came up and said, yeah, here he is. Why do I like you? Um, we're all going to do that from time to time. What I would urge you is to look at people's conduct. And I don't think that I've seen Joe Biden, maybe with the exception of the crime bill in the 90s, do anything that would make a person of African-American background say, he doesn't like us because I'm an African-American. He thinks I'm lesser because I'm an African-American. Um, and so I, I think looking at people's conduct is what should be controlling. Doesn't mean the words don't matter, they do. And you gotta own them and be responsible for them. But in the end, when you have power and influence, what do you use it for? And I could point out a number of people who I think over time have used those things for, um, in ways that were discriminatory. I, I wouldn't put Biden in that group. I have plenty of disagreements with the president from a policy perspective. You know, I, I, I mean, I'll just pick one of them since I'm in this audience and why not really just stir the whole thing up? Like, forgiving student loan is, is one of the stupidest ideas I've ever heard in my life. And, and it's pandering. It's gross pandering to try to get 18 to 24 year olds and a little bit older um, off the couch and to vote for him. And as somebody who incurred student debt to go to both college and law school, and it took me 10 years after I graduated from law school to pay off that debt, I couldn't buy a house during that time. I couldn't buy a new car during that time. I, I had to pay my loans back. But guess what? It was a great investment. And it taught me something about being responsible. And, um, and so, you know, I have fundamental disagreements with the president on, on a lot of different policy issues. That's just one of them. Um, but I would never think in my 40 years of knowing him that Joe Biden's a racist. And um, I can understand why you would be offended by some of the things he said. But you asked me to give you my view into him as a person since I know him personally. And I, I think... I think Joe Biden would be genuinely hurt to think that you think he's a racist. Um, and I, I think it would really genuinely hurt him. And he would want to then, in pure Biden fashion, go completely over the top <laughs> to try to convince you that he isn't. Um, and then he would say even more offensive things, probably, <laughs> um, in that process. And, and that's just him. Um, but I, I do think. I will say one last thing because I know we're out of time. I think the way I was critical of the baby boomer generation. How old are you? 25. Okay. So this is what I want to say about yours. <laughs> Get some thicker skin. Okay? Um, I think this generation is too damn sensitive. I think you're looking for ways to be offended. And, you know, it's a tough world. And there are going to be moments when people are un unjust and unfair to you. And if every time you're like, oh, poor me, it's not right, it's not fair, it's not, like, I don't want to hear it, man. And, and I don't want to hear it because it doesn't make you better. I don't wish anything bad on anyone, no one. I spent a good part of my career standing up for justice. And I believe in the rule of law and I believe in justice for every person in this country. But sometimes it's not gonna work because this isn't a perfect country. And when it doesn't, if all you do is moan and complain about it and talk about just how unfair it is to you, my view is not going to make you a better, stronger, more successful person. Sometimes you just got to buck up and, and deal with it. 
and, and if you think that I'm talking about this like out of my hat, here's what I'd suggest you do. And this is the only circumstance I will ever suggest that any of you do this. Otherwise, this is a monumental waste of your time. I want you tonight, if you doubt me on this, to go on to Twitter and search me. I will guarantee you that if you do the math, 75% of the things that are put on Twitter about me have to do with my weight will have to do with that, he's this fat SOB, um, you know, they'll show pictures of trays of donuts or piles of pizzas and like incredible stuff that have nothing to do with the things that this guy said I had opposed that were dear to him, have nothing to do with anything I've ever said, have nothing to do with my party, or my position, but have to do with the dirty little secret that I'm overweight. If I got into the fetal position because of those comments, I would have never gone anywhere. And the fact is that there are going to be a lot of people who are going to say a lot of really unfair, nasty things about you either you specifically or the member of the ethnic, racial, religious, gender identification that you have. And if you look at it, you'll like, I hope when you, if you do it, that you'll look at it and be embarrassed that people would do this kind of stuff. But I will tell you, it's relentless, relentless. I make a comment about Ukraine, somehow it has to do with the fact that I'm fat. <laughs> I say something about Israel, it's because he's fat. I say something about student loans, it's because he wants more money to buy more pizza. I mean, like, <laughs> it, I'm telling you, go do it. It's unreal. And I raise it to you to say, I'm not sitting up here saying this stuff to you with a lack of experience about harsh words that are unfair and irrelevant to anything that I've done as a public official, or quite frankly, anything I've done as a husband or a father. But like, I don't not come here because of that. I don't not continue to speak out. I don't not continue to do things because I know that's gonna be an element of it. So that's what I'd say to your generation, is there are things that are more important than how you feel and the future of this country is more important than how you feel. And if you got something to offer, get ready for the incoming, but what you accomplish is gonna be much more important to you, to your family, and to this country. Remember something John Adams said, writing for his diary, right before his death, he was worried that the country was becoming too partisan and too divided in 1825. <laughs> and this is what he wrote in his, his diary. He said, you shall never know the sacrifices that were made to secure for you your liberty. I pray you make a good use of it. For if you do not, I shall repent in heaven for ever having made the sacrifices at all. We are the most privileged lucky people the world has ever known. I want to make sure when you're 60 that you feel the same way that I do and the same way John Adams felt, that the sacrifices were worth it. And if we put our feelings ahead of that, it's unlikely that we will feel that way. So I, if I leave you with anything, Everything I've done in my public life hasn't been perfect, but it's been motivated towards trying to pay back to a country that has given a guy who's the son of someone who worked in the Briars ice cream plant and the mother who worked as a receptionist 
the opportunity to run twice for president of the United States. This ain't such a bad place. Governor Christie, thank you so much. Thanks,